Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 225. Today's big Bible question, is the salvation of Jesus for anybody, even the worst kinds of people? Well, hello, friends. Happy Saturday to you. Short intro today because, hey, it's the weekend and we've all got massive parties and gatherings to get to, right? Oh, wait, maybe we don't. Nevertheless, we press on. Today's Bible readings are somewhat out of order for reasons that will become clear when we read them. Ruth chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 36 and 45, huh? Psalms chapter 9 and Acts chapter 26. Now, our focus passage is in Acts 26, but you better believe we're going to focus in on Ruth at some point because Ruth was the first whole book of the Bible I ever read. My aunt got me a Bible when I was a wee lad. It was a small Bible with a cover made out of solid olive wood from the Holy Land, or at least that's what it said uh, on the inside cover. And buddy, I love that Bible, and I wish I still had it. But I do clearly remember the day I, I don't know if I did it all in one day or if I did it over four days, but I finished the book of Ruth because it was the smallest book in the Bible I could find. It turns out there's a lot of other smaller books, but that was the smallest one I could find at like eight or seven or however old I was. And man, I was as pleased as punch that I had actually read an entire book of the Bible. I knew I was on the way to being canonized as a saint. Today, we are focused not on a saint, but on the villainous Saul, Paul, of the book of Acts. As we've discussed before, Saul was his Hebrew name and Paul his Gentile name. So there's kind of a myth out there that Uh, Saul's name got changed to Paul at conversion. And the reason for that is because the name Paul is used a little bit more post-conversion after Acts 9. But the fact is, he was pretty much Saul Paul his whole life, apparently. The only reason we hear more Paul in the latter parts of Acts is because Paul is with the Gentiles and the Greeks then. And that was the more appropriate name. So Paul's name wasn't changed at conversion, but his heart most certainly was. Saul slash Paul was an enemy of the church early on. Got a few pesky Christians you want arrested or even worse? Better call Saul. Now we don't know much about Saul slash Paul pre-encountering Jesus on the Damascus Road, but we do know a few important things for the word, from the word. For instance, number one, Saul was the official who oversaw and actually probably gave official approval to the vicious murder martyrdom of Stephen in Acts 7 and 8, where it says, They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he fell asleep. Saul agreed with putting him to death. Well, the second thing we know is that Saul attacked the church with vigor and oversaw the arresting of men and women and throwing them in prison, as we learn in Acts 8, verse 3, which says, Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. Now we learn number three. Saul not only traveled over 100 miles away from his home base to imprison Christians, he also threatened to kill multiple ones of them, as we learn in Acts 9 verse 1. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So, most Christians know Paul's story, at least to a degree. But the more we dig into his life before Christ, the more astonishing it is that God chose to save him. What a crazy thing. Well, let's read Acts 26 and hear Paul's testimony. Acts 26, verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. 
All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that according to the strict sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee, and now I stand on trial because of the hope and what God promised to our ancestors, the promise our twelve tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and a commission from the chief priest, King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I asked, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I have had help from God, and I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah must suffer, and that, as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You are out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, If I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, on the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment, for the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly to him. For I am convinced that none of these things has escaped his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you but all who listen to me today might become as I am except for these chains. The king, the governor, Bernice, and those listening with him got up, and when they had left, they talked with each other and said, This man is not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. So listen one more time to Paul describe himself uh, and his attitude towards Christians. In Acts 26, he says in verse 8, Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I actually did this in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. Holy cow. So Paul testified and apparently like approved, and I think that's even a legal term, approved of these saints not only being arrested, but being killed for testifying to Jesus. Not only that, that Paul would try to get them to blaspheme God. And he says he was terribly enraged at them. So marvel at the incredible grace of God 
and honestly the mysterious providence of God that would choose to save a sinner and enemy such as Saul Paul, it boggles the mind. When Paul describes himself as the chief of sinners, I think we now have a better idea what he actually meant by that expression. He wasn't really exaggerating. He was a scoundrel and a vile, enraged, impassioned enemy of Jesus, and Jesus chose to save him. You know, Paul didn't come to Jesus voluntarily. Paul didn't initiate salvation. Paul didn't listen to three stanzas of, I have decided to follow Jesus, and then go down on the third time as the preacher was tugging at his heart. Paul was an enemy of Jesus, and Jesus confronted him. Jesus initiates salvation. Jesus initiated salvation for Saul Paul. And it reminds me of John Bunyan's story. Bunyan, who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, if you don't remember, was an enemy of God also. Though he didn't spend his early life attacking Christians and sentencing them to death, he was apparently a man of such blasphemy that others were like scared to be around him. And I don't know if they thought lightning bolts were going to hit them or whatever, but like it was intimidating how blasphemous he was before he came to Christ. Now, here's an excerpt from his autobiography, the autobiography of John Bunyan, which honestly has the greatest title ever of any Christian book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And this is what Bunyan says. Breaking out in the bitterness of my soul, I said to myself with a grievous sigh, how can God comfort such a wretch as I? I had no sooner said it, but this returned upon me as an echo does answer a voice. This sin is not unto death. At which I was as if I had been raised out of a grave and cried out again, Lord, how could you find out such a word as this? For I was filled with admiration at the fitness and also the unexpectedness of the word, the fitness of the word, the rightness of the timing of it, the power and the sweetness and the light and the glory that came with it also was marvelous to me to find. I was now for the time out of doubt as to that which about which I was so much in doubt before. My fears before that what was that my sin, all that blasphemy, was not pardonable and so that I had no right to pray, to repent, or that if I did, it would be of no advantage or profit to me. But now, I thought, if this sin is not unto death, then it is forgivable. Therefore, from this I have encouragement to come to God by Christ for mercy, to consider the promise of forgiveness as that which stands with open arms to receive me as well as others. This, therefore, was a great easing to my mind that my sin was forgivable, that it was not the sin unto death. None but those that know what my trouble by their own experience was can tell what relief came to my soul by this consideration. It was a release to me from my former bonds and a shelter from my former storm. I seem now to stand upon the same ground with other sinners and to have as good a right to the word and prayer as any of them. But the next day, And at evening, being under many fears again, I went to seek the Lord. And as I prayed, I cried, and my soul cried to him in these words with strong cries, O Lord, I beg you, show me that you have loved me with everlasting love, like Jeremiah 31, 3 says. And Bunyan says, I had no sooner said it, but with sweetness it returned unto me like an echo or sounding again, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Now I went to bed all quiet. Also, when I awake the next morning, it was fresh upon my soul, and I believed it. At another time, says Bunyan, I remembered I was again under much questioning whether the blood of Christ was sufficient to save my soul, in which doubt I continued from morning till about seven or eight at night. And at last, when I was, as it were, quite worn out with fear, lest it should not lay hold on me, these words sounded again suddenly within my heart. He is able. But I thought this word able was spoke so loud unto me, it showed such a great word, it seemed to be written in my heart in great letters, and it gave a huge jostle to my fear and doubt. I mean for the time it tarried with me, which was about a day, uh, as I had never heard from that all my life, either, either before or after that. But one morning, when I was again at prayer, and trembling under the fear of this, that no word of God could help me, that piece of a sentence darted in upon me, 
My grace is sufficient. At this I thought I felt some help, as if there might be hope. But oh, how good a thing it is for God to send his word. For about two weeks before, I was looking on this very place, and then I thought it could not come near my soul with comfort. Therefore, I threw down my Bible in a pet. Then I thought it was not large enough for me. No, not large enough, but now it was as if it had arms of grace so wide that it could not only enclose me, but many more besides. That's a powerful word from Bunyan. Over and over again, Bunyan would have doubts, and he would go to the Lord with his doubts because he had been such a sinner, such a blasphemer before this. He was worried that his sin was unforgivable. He was worried that God could not have grace over him. And over and over again, God would speak his word into Bunyan's heart. And he says it was like an echo or a sounding. And sometimes it came at him so hard, it like blasted onto his mind. And he was reminded of beautiful promises like Hebrews 7.25, which says, Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. And friends, some of you out there listening to this, you doubt and have been doubting whether or not God is able to save you because you feel like a chief sinner. And I want to read that to you again and say this to you, yes, directly to you, personally to you. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him since he always leaves, lives to intercede for them. That's Hebrews 7.25. God is able. His grace is sufficient. Now look to him and be saved and trust him to save you and walk in beautiful assurance of salvation. You're not saved by works. You are saved by looking to Jesus by grace through faith in what he did for you on the cross. Rest in the assurance of Jesus, dear friend. You are not beyond his reach. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. During the times of the judges, there was a famine in the land, and a man left Bethlehem and Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died, and she was left with her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah, and the second was named Ruth. After they lived in Moab about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, and the woman was left without her two children and without her husband. She and her daughters-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab because she had heard in Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people's need by providing them food. She left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, and traveled along the road leading back to the land of Judah. Naomi said to them, Each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to the dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you rest in the house of a new husband. She kissed them, and they wept loudly, and they said to her, We insist on returning with you to your people. But Naomi replied, Return home, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Am I able to give any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. Go on, for I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought... There was still hope for me to have a husband tonight and to bear sons. Would you be willing to wait for them to grow up? Would you restrain yourselves from remarrying? No, my daughters, my life is much too bitter for you to share because the Lord's hand is turned against me. Again, they wept loudly and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, Don't plead with me to abandon you or to return and not follow you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me and do so severely if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped talking to her. The two of them traveled until they came to Bethlehem, and when they entered Bethlehem, the whole town was excited about their arrival, 
and the local women explain, exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, which means bitterness. She answered, For the Lord Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has opposed me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi came back from the territory of Moab with her daughter-in-law Ruth the Moabitess. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 1. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the nations from the time I first spoke to you during Josiah's reign until today. Perhaps when the house of Judah hears about all the disaster I am planning to bring on them, each one of them will turn from this evil way. Then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. So Jeremiah summoned Baruch, son of Neriah. At Jeremiah's dictation, Baruch wrote on a scroll all the words the Lord had spoken to Jeremiah. Then Jeremiah commanded Baruch, I am restricted, I cannot enter the temple of the Lord, so you must go and read from the scroll which you wrote at my dictation. The words of the Lord in the hearing of the people at the temple of the Lord on a day of fasting. Read his words in the hearing of all the Judeans who are coming from their cities. Perhaps their petition will come before the Lord, and each one will turn from his evil way. For the anger and fury that the Lord has pronounced against this people are intense. So Baruch, son of Neriah, did everything the prophet Jeremiah had commanded him. At the Lord's temple, he read the Lord's words from the scroll. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people of Jerusalem and all these coming in from Judah's cities into Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. Then then at the Lord's temple in the chamber of Gemariah, son of Shaphan, the scribe, an upper courtyard, at the opening of the new gate of the Lord's temple, in the hearing of the people, Baruch read Jeremiah's words from the scroll. When Micaiah, son of Gemariah, son of Shaphan, heard all of the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the scribe's chamber in the king's palace. All the officials were sitting there, Elishama the scribe, Delilah, son of Shemaliah, Elnathan, son of Achbor, Gemariah, son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, son of Hananiah, and all the other officials. Micaiah reported to them all the words he had heard when Baruch read from the scroll in the hearing of the people. Then all the officials sent word to Baruch through Jehudi, son of Nathaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of Cushi, saying, Bring the scroll that you read in the hearing of the people and come. So Baruch, son of Neriah, took the scroll and went to them. They said to him, Sit down and read it in our hearing. So Baruch read it in their hearing. When they heard all the words, they turned to each other and said to Baruch, In fear, we must surely tell the king all these things. Then they asked Baruch, Tell us, how did you write all these words? At his dictation? Baruch said to them, At his dictation. He recited all these words to me while I was writing on the scroll in ink. The official said to Baruch, You and Jeremiah must hide and tell no one where you are. Then after depositing the scroll in the chamber of Elishamah the scribe, the officials came to the king at the courtyard and reported everything in the hearing of the king. The king sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elishamah the scribe. Jehudi then read it in the hearing of the king and all the officials who were standing by the king. Since it was the ninth month, the king was sitting in his winter quarters with a fire burning in front of him. As soon as Jehudi would read three or four columns, Jehoiakim would cut the scroll with a scribe's knife and throw the columns into the fire in the hearth until the entire scroll was consumed by the fire in the hearth. After, As they heard all these words, the king and all his servants did not become terrified or tear their clothes. Even though Elnathan, Deliah, and Gamariah had urged the king not to burn the scroll, he did not listen to them. Then the king commanded Jerahamiel, the king's son, Seralah, son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, son of Abdeel, to seize the scribe Baruch and the prophet Jeremiah, but the Lord hid them. After the king had burned the scroll and the words Baruch had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, take another scroll and once again write on it the original words that were on the original scroll that King Jehoiakim of Judah burned. You are to proclaim concerning King Jehoiakim of Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have burned the scroll asking, why have you written on it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause it to be without people or animals? Therefore, 
This is what the Lord says concerning King Jehoiakim of Judah. He will have no one to sit on David's throne, and his corpse will be thrown out to be exposed to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. I will punish him, his descendants, and his officers for their iniquity. I will bring on them, on the residents of Jerusalem and on the people of Judah, all the disaster which I warned them about, but they did not listen. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch, son of Neriah the scribe, and he wrote on it at Jeremiah's dictation all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, Judah's king, had burned in the fire, and many other words like them were added. Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 1. This is the word that the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Baruch, son of Neriah, when he wrote these words on a scroll at Jeremiah's dictation in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to you, Baruch. You have said, Woe is me, because the Lord has added misery to my pain. I am worn out with groaning and have found no rest. This is what you are to say to him. This is what the Lord says. What I have built, I am about to demolish, and what I have planted, I am about to uproot the whole land. But as for you, do you pursue great things for yourself? Stop pursuing, for I am about to bring disaster on all humanity. This is the Lord's declaration. But I will grant you your life like the spoils of war wherever you go. Psalm chapter 9 verse 1. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will sing about your name, Most High. When my enemies retreat, they stumble and perish before you, for you have upheld my just cause. You are seated on your throne as a righteous judge. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have erased their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to eternal ruin. You have uprooted the cities, and the very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he judges the world with righteousness. He executes judgment on the nations with fairness. The Lord is a refuge for the persecuted, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, Lord. Sing to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Proclaim his deeds among the nations. For the one who seeks an accounting for bloodshed remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the oppressed. Be gracious to me, Lord. Consider my affliction at the hands of those who hate me. Lift me up from the gates of death so that I may declare all your praises. I will rejoice in your salvation within the gates of daughter Zion. The nations have fallen into the pit they made. Their foot is caught in the net they have concealed. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed justice, snaring the wicked by the work of their hands. Higion, Selah. The wicked will return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten. The hope of the oppressed will not perish forever. Rise up, Lord. Do not let mere humans prevail. Let the nations be judged in your presence. Put terror in them, Lord. Let the nations know they are only humans. Selah. Yes, Lord, and amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and may the Lord bless you, dear friends. Godspeed.